Hi everyone, it's Simon here to take you through the platform and adventure games with one RPG at the end of the demos that I played for our Steam Next Fest Summer Festival 2022. Now, these games I'll run through the demos, how I felt about them, and whether or not they stayed on my wish list. And we're going to start off with the first of two Sonic clone games called Panic Porcupine. In Panic Porcupine, you play as a 2D Sonic clone, but it's a porcupine instead. And yes, the porcupine looks a little bit worse for wear, which I found quite funny. But this game absolutely nails what an early Sonic game felt like to play back then. And what we kind of sometimes still see through rose-tinted glasses now. This is all about momentum, this game. And so quite a lot of the environments end up becoming almost like half pipes where you're pressing the spin button so that you can roll around hills and then fling yourself off the edge and try and guide yourself onto increasingly narrow platforms so that you can survive. The difficulty of this game is slightly above what you'd normally expect from a mascot mascot platformer so please be aware of that because quite early on it's already doing things like uh, trying to get momentum, getting across big ginormous spike pits and landing in the right place and I expect more of that to continue as the difficulty ups and ups and ups as you go through the game but I really like the fact that it knows it's a clone and plays into that some of the level names were quite funny uh, but also just the fact that it nails that feel of speed control uh, predictability and it also comes with a pretty damn funky chip tune soundtrack too so absolutely stays on my wish list this one the second Sonic clone style game is Spark the Electric Jester 3, and this is much more around the 3D version of what Sonic has become today, which had me slightly worried. I've already bought Spark 1 and 2 because they were built on 2D Sonic clone games, and they're fantastic, and in some ways actually better than the originals uh, that were inspiring it. And so I was hoping for the same for Spark 3, and I'm delighted to say that my worries shouldn't have been there because this handles like a dream, and how Sonic 3D games really should have done straight out the bag. This game is fluid, it has a sense of speed, it's got motion and fluidity to it, and predictability too. So whenever you're trying to get up a hill, you can like do a homing missile bounce attack on various enemies and it just naturally pings you up and you've got enough time to reconnect and dive in for the next bit. It feels like going down a 3D pinball machine tunnel because of the way how the levels are designed. So you'll bounce around different enemies and then you'll reach the top and you'll hit automatically like a boost pad and you'll fling forward, do a loop the loop then you'll be on rails, bouncing back and forth and so on like that. And it just handles beautifully and really nicely. There was also transitions to a more left to right 2D style environment too. So yeah, absolutely loving this. And it gave me like this game clearly feels like it's taking a Sonic Forces approach to how 3D Sonic works. And that for me is the game that's worked so far in this new era of Sonic. So, phew, I'm glad this one absolutely stays on my wish list too. Next game up is Being a Penguin. And the best experience in this demo that I had was at the very beginning when you're wandering around a horde of penguins or a collective of them. I'm not sure what the group name of a penguin uh, is. Uh, but before they go on a march, they're all wandering around and you, you can kind of just waddle around with them and like make some noises. And then when you hit anything, your penguin stacks it in the most adorable way possible. So basically, I got a bit sadistic and was just stacking it into everything because it was funny. <laughs> um, however, outside of that, I did find that this game was quite dull but also quite harsh to the eyes. There's an awful lot of low poly, bright, visible white and light blue. And that masked with quite a difficult to read black clunked together text meant that I struggled with some of the story elements. It also felt like this game was going to veer down a fetch quest route, but without really putting in too much in the way of platforming uh, in front of you. Now that may change beyond the demo itself, but I wasn't necessarily engaged or inspired by the demo beyond the fact that the penguin was cute. And whilst they've nailed that, and that's quite an important element to have, I remain to be convinced by the gameplay that comes out in front of it. So it's staying on my wish list for now, but it's not necessarily a recommendation from me. In a total flipper form, Rain Boy is high maintenance, high stakes, high energy and high difficulty. This is a 2D precision platformer aimed at the hardcore crowd and it took me a while to understand what the nuance is of this game. So I'm going to try and explain it but I'll probably over explain it and you'll get it more by seeing it on the screen. Your character, which reminds me a little bit of Flashback where it's got like really hyper realistic animation frames or like too many of them as it wanders around in like a retro future style 
As you run, jump, bounce, whatever it is that you're doing, you also have this grapple hook, but it's not a strict grapple hook to hang on to these circular things with like uh, red, blue, green, and yellow like dots in the middle. It's anchor points for a grapple ball. And so wherever the ball bounces off is actually where you end up repelling to. And so, yes, they're repel points to trigger the actual grapple hook, but it might be that the ball then bounces off to a slightly different direction, and that seems to be where you end up and reappear. It's as if it's like a transporting egg in a way more than a grapple hook and then you can do like your jump or continue running again and it took me a while to kind of click that that's how this works and once I did I started to enjoy the game a lot and enjoy the challenge that it brung because it was challenging it was tricky uh, and I think this is much more at the hardcore audience than the casual gamer but if you would enjoy those kind of platform adventures this will be right up your street. The Courier is a game that I would absolutely recommend to anyone that enjoyed playing the game Lake earlier on, I think it was this year or towards the end of last year it was released. That was you playing as a post lady, uh, driving around in a car around a certain city, enjoying and interacting with all the neighbours. The Courier is basically that game but as a paper girl, uh, riding around on a bicycle in an isometric island. Love the atmosphere, very wholesome, very cute, uh, and the relaxed vibes were very, very fitting for what's going on around you, which was essentially an extended fetch quest and collectible thon. <laughs> but that was fine because of the way how the levels and the world and the island kind of was unveiled to you. There was lots of little tiny puzzles or little tiny platforming elements of trying to negate ramps to get over gates so that you could unlock them from the other side or finding new shortcuts to try and get from one area to another. Lots of mini games too, like mowing lawns, collecting and hoarding sheep or herding sheep, sorry, um, or getting various collectibles within a certain time limit, things like that. It seemed nice and relaxed and chilled. The actual bicycle itself handled very nicely. My only minor complaint with this was that the camera would quite often be obscured because you'd have lots of like big giant trees in the way. And whilst you'd have a silhouette showing where you were behind that, I'd have preferred it if actually the tree would have like vaporized away to show me as the character, not an outline of myself. Equally relaxed and also reminding me of Proteus, in part because of the graphics, but also because it's a tranquil game, is Paradise March. Now, this is a bit like games like Alicon, where you're taking photos of different um, animals and things like that. But instead of taking photos, you're collecting them with your fishing net and then kind of releasing them back into the wild as you collect in your notepad all of the different animals and creatures that you collect. There appears to be a day and night cycle involved and different animals appear in different locations in the island um, as you go at different times of that cycle. So there's a mild puzzle element there, but apart from that, you was just free to wander around and enjoy your time with some lovely visuals, which I know won't like appeal to everyone, but I quite like the art style here. Uh, soothing music and just go at your own pace see what you can find in the world around you my only concern with this is that I'm not necessarily sure what else there is to the gaming experience and how big the island is in the full game and I think that will very much determine for me whether or not this is like a stay on my wish list and pick it up at a decent price or wait for an extremely deep sale because I know it will be a very short adventure but Paradise March was interesting enough to keep on my wish list the first of four traditional platformers up now is Koa and the Five Pirates of Mara. And this game is the first fully on platformer game from Chibig after doing quite a few life sims in the Mara series, which I always enjoyed. I'm delighted to say that whilst this is clearly aimed towards a younger audience, the actual platforming involved here is done really well. And it reminds me very much of Croc 2, actually. And that was where you could kind of go, oh, it's aimed at kids, but actually there's enough juiciness here for proper adults to get involved too. And that kind of parallel also evolves onto the camera side of things because whilst with Crash Bandicoot games, you'd always be going forward or backwards down a tunnel of something. And occasionally you'd have like missions to the side screen. So it'd be like a 2D side scroller. With this, the camera constantly moves around into certain locations. So you could be moving left to right, right to left, forward, back, back to forward, or away and towards the camera. 
and that kept things fresh as you moved through different environments. Koa handles really well as a character. I adore the soundtrack to this game. There's one key twist with the way how Koa plays, though, that took me a while to get used to, and I think might be an issue for younger players, and it's her role. Um, quite often with platformers, you can trigger like your role or something for when you land after a jump whilst you're still in midair, but with Koa, you need to be able to trigger it bang on her landing, and I found it a little bit hit and miss. So maybe being a little bit more forgiving and allowing people to tee up that move early on before she lands could be quite helpful. But yeah, sold on this one, definitely picking it up. The next game on this list is also suitably retro and it's called Frogun. And that's because in this cubic world that you're traversing around, you have a frog that you can squeeze and its tongue becomes a gun that you can then stick onto various walls and kind of lasso yourself across there. The beauty of this is that quite a lot of the level design seems to involve you being able to reach lots and lots of points that you wouldn't necessarily think you would be able to reach with this gun because the gun is sticky to an awful lot of different objects. Um, and so it's not just like one type of thing that you can stick to. It's like loads of different walls and the levels are designed with that in fact. So there's a little bit of, it feels like you're cheesing some of the moves, but actually the levels are designed around it, which I thought was quite cool. I also really like the fact that because it's very blocky and it reminds me of the way how like Karashi Final and Cooler World and games like that were built on very cubic angular 90 degree corner things. This is built with that in mind, but it also controls in that way, but allows you with full fluid camera motion around you. So it works oddly really well because everything is cubic. <laughs> so. Some people who are used to very modern day consoles and like high end gaming will probably look at this and go, what? But for retro gamers like myself that have been around for decades, if you enjoyed like late 90s, early 2000s style of platform adventure games where cubic movement was by par or by by the rules, this is a throwback to that era. And if you enjoyed that, you'll love Frogum. The next game up I have very mixed emotions of, and it's called Aztlan Uncovered. When I saw this game, I thought, oh, discount Tomb Raider. And to be fair, I'm not wrong. <laughs> it is a discount Tomb Raider, but in a weird way. This game, um, and I have no problems with discount Tomb Raiders. Let's be very clear about that. So long as it adds something new and interesting to the table or has a twist on something, I think everything deserves its own merit. And Aztlan Advent Uncovered sorry, does just that because your character that you control has this sphere of energy around them that takes whatever's inside that sphere back in time. And all the puzzles are designed around this. So in the demo, there's lots of light puzzles where you're shining a, a pillar of uh, sunbeam uh, from puzzle, uh, pillar to pillar to pillar. And so what you're having to do is drag and move various pillars into places. And then what you would do is one of them would be broken. So you'd then need to shine a light uh, from that pillar by sending out your sphere to rebuild that pillar around you. Or it could be that like corridors were blocked because there's been some smashed uh, debris down. So you would set off your sphere and it would rebuild the pillar. And so you'd be able to get through the gap again. All of that's really, really cool. The problem and the dissonance that I have with this is that it feels like it's a retro old school, like basic Tomb Raider style game, but it's doing it with mobile trappings and it feels like it's been built using mobile assets and mobile physics and more crucially, mobile collision detection. Like I was hitting invisible walls. I was hitting, I was trying to walk across things that looked like they were jagged and I was like off the floor levitating, walking through them. I'd have problems with lag and I'd kind of run off the edge of ledges or not be able to hit something. I also got stuck in walls quite often. This was quite buggy in a collision detection way. And if that can be solved, then there could be something quite nice here. But at the moment I would hold off for now because it just feels a little bit too rough around the edges uh, for where it's going. And I don't feel convinced with the physics of the game, even if I think the actual puzzles and the setting around it is actually quite sound. And then the final traditional platformer that we've got is Misk A Tiny Tale. And this is a case for me of, oh God, please change that one thing and you've got a good game. <laughs> This game is, I adore any games that have got that kind of Honey, I Shrunk the Kids vibe, where you're down doing like, 
you're a tiny thing and the world around you is now massive and you're playing as nuts and bolts running around doing a very traditional 3D platformer, loads of collectibles, lots of platforming and traversal, and your character has lots of um, moves at their disposal to be able to navigate around all of these different worlds. And I loved all of that, but there's one thing that absolutely ruined the experience for me and it's the camera. The camera is so overly sensitive and it's so rushed that as soon as you touch, even with the slightest nudge on the right analog stick to move something around, it spins 180 degrees. And the problem with that is that I couldn't actually walk in a straight line if I chose to move anything with the right analog stick. So what I was doing was trying to maneuver the camera around with how I was moving instead. Um, it was odd and it was awkward and the camera movement was that violent that it was making me feel sick. So in the end, I had to stop playing this game because it was making me sick. But that camera is awful and it needs to be changed like immediately. The Steam discussion group for this game is just full of the exact same comment over and over and over again. It's very rare that a platformer game makes me feel sick. Occasionally, I do get motion sickness from games themselves if it's like very psychedelic and very strained on my eyes. This is the first time I think ever I've had a, like, not even a first person game make me feel sick. On to some weird and wonderful games now, and the first one up is Wormatosa. This game sees you playing as a worm trying to get through an intestinal tract. Hmm, nom nom. <laughs> and the way how you do this is by propelling yourself from edge to edge of the tract. So you can see where the worm's little head is. What you need to do, a bit like firing a cannonball actually, is that you would then decide to aim your head forward and then you've got two moves. You can either just fling yourself forward and you do that with the analog stick and pressing of a button and it will bury itself in the skin on the other side and get ready for wherever it lands. Or you can press and hold a button and it's kind of like um, as if you're drawing a snake out and then you've got to try and like navigate it round almost like do you remember those um the buzzer game where you've got like a, a ring loop of electricity and you've got to kind of guide it around an intestinal tract that way it felt a little bit like a digital version of that to be honest really interesting gameplay setup felt unique really like the theming as well because what you're having to do was to time all of your movements to either avoid the intestinal tract spasming and closing doors and therefore chopping you in half as you went through or the bacteria that was moving back and forth and doing all kinds of patrols because as soon as they touch you, it was game over and back to the beginning of the level. Going to be really tricky, quite difficult to get around, but a genuinely unique and interesting theme and experience, so it utterly stays on my wish list. The next game up is I Am Butter, and it's not from the same people that did I Am Bread, and you can really tell because I didn't come away with great impressions from this game. The problem with I Am Butter is that you're viewing getting your butter that you control into the butter bin, um, or tub rather, uh, from very fixed single camera perspectives as you move across an environment. And it's very difficult to understand A, the depth perception of where you're going, but the control scheme for this game is weird. So you maneuver yourself around like as if you're a 3D tank. So you have to like use the face buttons on the controller to like shimmy yourself around but you don't really see what your front is until you move and so what I was finding was that when I would then move and you move by like mini hops or giant bounces and jumps sometimes I thought I was facing one way and I was the other and I'd bounce off the screen or off the table or down a hole and it was game over and back to the beginning of that specific screen it also because everything is so yellow and uh black quite difficult to understand what's a safe zone and what's not so I kept on ending up in weird locations and because everything is around a jump it gives you an arc of where it thinks where it's telling you where you're going to land but the arc isn't actually where you land and so there's an error there that needs to be calibrated because I was ending up in places that the arc was telling me that I would not be in which meant back to the beginning. The single fixed camera view as well caused problems for me because quite often I'd end up at the edge of a screen and not able to see where I was and then because you've got to shuffle around and get everywhere it just was cumbersome and I got quite tired and frustrated of the game quite quickly and not in a good way. You can, you can be stupid and fun with these types of games and get away with it. This was the wrong side of that. 
The biggest surprise for me of the games that I had downloaded but I'd never heard of was Naru the Forgotten Lands. And this sees you play as this orb of light wandering through a ruin, bringing it back to life. And the beauty of how it does this reminds me of the game Flower, specifically level one as well, and the final level of that game. Whereas you move through the world, it turns everything that's drab around you into vibrant life. So grass grows back green again. The sands become a... Uh, excellent hue of, hue of orange uh, the lights all turn on and start guiding you the way um, but as you move through all of these different puzzles in these environments and turning on various contraptions the whole world and ruin around you starts to come mechanically to life as well and it's so it's interesting that just moving forward felt like an event and it didn't get old during that experience as well because you could go back and see where you'd gone before and be like hmm I've put that all back to life and have like a odd satisfaction to it. I also found myself strangely trying to paint all of the rooms so that everything was brought back to life again as well. Maybe that's just more about me than anything else. The puzzles were really well done. I really like the fact that the dynamic camera guides you to when you're solving a puzzle in one part of the ruin, it would show you what it was unlocking elsewhere. And it just naturally felt like everything was coming to life together. And so this is absolutely staying on my wish list. It's probably a day one. I liked it that much. The game I liked least out of all of these games, though, is the next one, which is called The Ball Flow, Nature and Light. Now, this is one of those uh, marble physics style platform games where you roll around various environments and then change the um, element of your ball so that it can then do different things. So you've got like a fire or a stone or a water or a wind one um, is the kind of theming for this. But the camera in this is awful. The physics didn't work properly. The levels don't explain themselves properly. Um, I was glitching in and out from the game itself. I got stuck off screen and it wouldn't load the menus. I have really wrestled with this game for about 10 to 15 minutes and then just gave up because it felt really unresponsive, un not unplayable, but it just... It felt really drab and I didn't really understand what it was trying to do, which is a shame because normally I really like these types of games and this just turned me cold. So yeah, not a recommendation and it is the only game out of everything on this list that I have removed clean off my wish list, and I know I won't touch. The final game on this list is an RPG and it's because I only got the chance to play one for a little while and I didn't know where else to put it. So it's here and it's called Video Game Fables and it's a hearty recommendation, especially if you like your comedy or send up games. This is an RPG that is designed to subvert the genre. So it's sending up all of the tropes of like princesses being kidnapped. So you play as a princess that gets bored of having to wait in her cell. And she's like, screw this, I'm going to solve all the problems myself. And then because she subverts all of the tropes of an RPG. It's causing problems in all the world around her and things start glitching out and things disappear and like everything falls over and the baddie then ends up becoming too scared and so he joins your party and things like that. So yeah, really funny, witty dialogue, quite decent in the way how the actual battle system works as well. So when you hit into battle, each move that you take takes a couple of turns to enact so if you want a stronger attack then it will take more turns for it to generate and so that leaps you open to being attacked during that time so you need to kind of decide whether you want to go for speed or for like tanky damage the other thing as well is that your party all levels up together with various different points so that means that whenever you level up, you're choosing to level up all of your characters in your party together, and that improves their HP stats, but also the amount of equipment that they can hold as well. You can also choose to then spend XP to level up what skills that they can have attributed and available to them too. All of your equipment then is dictated around what the level up of your party is and how much XP you've spent on them. So you have to kind of decide whether or not you want to spend all of your XP on a certain character and fill them up with equipment so that they can become the tank and the the big main party person and then just leave the other ones hanging on or if you want to spread things equally. Really interesting concept, loved the vibe and uh, feel of this game and the comedy was spot on so absolutely stays on my wish list. So thank you so much for everyone for watching this video. If you've got any comments or suggestions or thoughts or questions around any of these games, please drop them down below and I'll try and help you out wherever possible. 
Just two more videos to go in this Steam Next Fest Summer 2022 series. I hope it's been enjoyable and informative. Thanks for watching. Higher Plane Games is part of the Higher Plane Network, a completely independent media outlet supported by people like you. The goal is to create the best possible content that cultivates a richer indie scene for games as well as music and entertainment. To find out more and to get involved, visit patreon.com forward slash higher plane network. Your support makes all the difference, and in return you'll gain access to bonus content and downloads. Thank you for watching.